Hello friends and good tidings. This is The Art of War by Sun Tzu, an audiobook. The Art of War is an influential document written by the ancient Chinese military strategist Sun Tzu. It is one of the first known treatises on warfare strategy in history. Published in the 5th century BC, its teachings hold true to this day. Consisting of 13 chapters, it delves into all realms of warfare and its intricacies. Let us begin. Enjoy. Chapter 1 Laying Plans Master Sun said, War is a grave affair of state. It is a place of life and death, a path to survival and extinction, a matter to be pondered with care. There are five fundamentals for this deliberation, for the making of comparisons and the assessing of conditions. Those are the way, the heaven, the earth, command, and discipline. The way courses meant to be of one mind with their rulers, to live or die with them, and never to give in to fear. The heaven is yin and yang, cold and hot, woman and man, and the cycle of seasons. The earth is height and depth, distance and proximity, ease and danger, open and confined ground to live and to die. Command is wisdom, integrity, compassion, courage, and severity. Discipline is organization, the chain of command and control of expenditure. Every commander is aware of these five fundamentals. He who grasps them wins, he who fails to grasp them loses. For this deliberation, for the making of comparisons and the assessing of conditions, we discover which ruler has the way, which general has the ability, which side has heaven and earth, on which side is discipline more effective, which army is the stronger, whose officers and men are better trained in which army are rewards and punishments clearest. From these can be known as victory and defeat. Heed my plan, employ it, and victory is surely yours. Do not heed my plan, and even if you did employ me, you would surely be defeated. Settle on the best plan, exploit the dynamic within, develop it without, follow the advantage, and master opportunity. This is the dynamic, the way of war, is a way of deception. When able, feign inability. When deploying troops, appear not to be. When near, appear far. When far, appear near. Lure with bait, strike with chaos. If the enemy is full, be prepared. If strong, avoid him. If he is angry, disconnect him. If he is weak, stir his pride. If he is relaxed, boda him. If his men are harmonious, split them. Attack where he is unprepared, appear where you are unexpected. This is victory in warfare. It cannot be divulged in advance. Victory belongs to the side that scores most in the calculations before battle. Defeat belongs to the side that scores least in the calculations before battle. Most spells victory, least spells defeat, none surer defeat. See it in this way, and the outcome is apparent. Chapter 2. Waging War In war, for an army of 1,000 four-horse swift chariots, 1,000 hide-armoured wagons, for 100,000 mail-clad soldiers, with provisions for 400 miles, allowing for expenses at home and the front, dealings with envoys and advisers, repairs to chariots and armour, the daily cost of all this will exceed 1,000 tails of silver. In war, victory should be swift. If victory is slow, men tire, morale drops. Sigis exhaust strength, long campaigns strain the public treasury. If men are tiered, morale low, strength exhausted, and trees are spent, the feudal lords will exploit the disarray and attack. And then even the wizard will be powerless to men. I have heard that in war, haste can be folly, but have never seen delay. That was wise. No nation has ever benefited from a long war. Without a full understanding of the harm caused by war, it is impossible to understand the most profitable way of conducting it. The Skillful Warrior 
never conscripts troops a second time, never transports provisions a third. He brings equipment from home, but forages off the enemy. And so his men have plenty to eat. Supplying an army at a distance drains the public coffers and impoverishes the common people. Where an army is close at hand, prices rise. When prices rise, the common people spend all they have. When they spend all, they feel the pinch of taxes and levies. Strength is depleted on the battlefield. Families at home are destitute. The common people lose seven-tenths of their wealth. Six-tenths of the public coffers are spent on broken chariots, worn-out horses, armour and helmets, crossbows and arrows, spears and buckles, lances and shields, draught animals, and heavy wagons. So a wise general feeds his army off the enemy. One peck of enemy provisions is worth twenty carried from home. One pkul of enemy fodder is worth twenty carried from home. The killing of an enemy stems from wrath. The fighting for booty stems from a desire for reward. In chariot fighting, when more than ten enemy chariots are captured, the man to take the first should be rewarded. Change the enemy's chariot flags and standards, mingle their chariots with yours, treat prisoners of war kindly and care for them. Use victory over the enemy to enhance your own strength. Chapter 3 Offensive Strategy Master Sun said, In war, better to take a state intact than to destroy it. Better take an army, a regiment, or a company intact than to destroy them. Ultimate excellence lies not in winning every battle, but in defeating the enemy without ever fighting. The highest form of warfare is to attack strategy itself. The next is to attack alliances. The next is to attack armies. The lowest form of war is to attack cities. Siege warfare is a last resort. In a siege, three months are needed to assemble shields, armoured wagons, and sundry siege weapons and equipment. Another three months to pile ramps. The general who cannot master his anger orders his troops out like ants, sending one in three to their deaths without taking the city. This is the calamity of siege warfare. The skillful strategist defeats the enemy without doing battle, captures the city without laying Z, overthrows the enemy's state without a long war. He strives for supremacy under heaven intact, his men and weapons still keen, his gain complete. This is the method of strategic attack in war with forces. 10. To the enemy's one, surround him. With five, attack him. With two, split in half. If equally matched, fight it out. If fewer in number, lie low. If weaker, escape. A small force. Obstinately fighting will be captured by a larger force. The general is the prop of the nation. When the prop is solid, the nation is strong. When the prop is flawed, the nation is weak. A ruler can bring misfortune upon his troops in three ways. Ordering them to advance or to retreat, when they should not, is called hobbling the army. Ignorant interference in military decisions confuses officers and men. Ignorant meddling in military appointments perplexes officers and men. When an army is confused, the feudal princes will cause trouble. This creates chaos in the ranks and gives away victory. There are the five essentials. For victory, know when to fight and when not to fight. Understand how to deploy large and small numbers. Have officers and men who share a single will. Be ready for the unexpected. Have a capable general unhampered by his sovereign. These five point the way to victory. Hence the saying, Know thy enemy, know thyself, and victory is never in doubt, not in a hundred battles. He who knows self but not the enemy will suffer one defeat for every victory. He who knows neither self nor enemy will fail in every battle. Chapter 4 Tactical Dispositions Master Sun said, 
the skillful warrior, first ensures his own invulnerability, then he waits for the enemy's vulnerability. Invulnerability rests with self, vulnerability with the enemy. The skillful warrior can achieve his own invulnerability, but he can never bring about the enemy's vulnerability, hence the saying, one can know victory and yet not achieve it. Invulnerability is defense. Vulnerability is offense. Defense implies a lack of. Attack implies an abundance of. A skillful defender hides beneath the earth. A skillful attacker moves above the heaven. Thus, they achieve protection and complete victory. To foresee, the ordinary victory of the common man is no true skill. To be victorious in battle and to be acclaimed, for one skill is no true feat, to lift autumn leaves is no strength, to see the sun and moon is no perception, to hear thunder is no quickness of hearing. The Skillful Warrior of Old One Easy The victories of the skillful warrior are not extraordinary victories, they bring neither fame for wisdom nor merit for valour. His victory is flawless because they are inevitable. He vanquished an already defeated enemy, the skillful warrior, takes his stand on invulnerable ground, he lets slip no chance of defeating the enemy. The victorious army is victorious first and seeks battle later. The defeated army does battle first and seeks victory later. The skillful strategist cultivates the way and preserves the law. Thus he is the master of victory and defeat. In war, there are five steps. Measurement, estimation, calculation, comparison, and victory. Earth determinus measurement. Measurement determinus estimation. Estimation determinus calculation. Calculation determinus comparison. Comparison determines victory. A victorious army is like a pound weight on the scale against a grain. A defeated army is like a grain on the scale against a pound weight. A victorious army is like pent-up water, crashing a thousand fathoms into a gorge. This is all a matter of tactical disposition. Chapter 5 Energy Master Sun said, Managing many is the same as managing few. It is a question of division. Fighting with many is the same as fighting with few. It is a matter of calling men with gongs and identifying them with flags. With a combination of indirect and direct, an army can hold off the enemy undefeated. With an understanding of weakness and strength, an army can strike like lighting on a tree, in warfare, engage directly, secure victory indirectly. The warrior skilled in indirect warfare is infinite as heaven and earth, inexhaustible as river and sea, he ends and begins again, like the sun and moon, dies and is born again, like the four seasons. There are but five notes, and yet their permutations are more than can ever be heard. There are but five colours, and yet their permutations are more than can ever be seen. There are but five flavours, and yet their permutations are more than can ever be tasted. In the dynamics of war, there are but these two, indirect and direct, and yet their permutations are inexhaustible. They give rise to each other in a never-ending circle. A rushing torrent carries boulders on its flood. Such is the energy of its momentum. A swooping falcon breaks the back of its prey. Such is the precision of its timing. The skillful warrior's energy is devastating his timing is taut. His energy is like a drawn crossbow. His timing like the release of a trigger. In the tumult of battle, the struggle may seem chaotic, but there is no disorder. In the confusion of the melee, the battle array may seem crooked, but defeat is out of the question. Disorder is founded on order, fear, on courage, weakness, on strength, orderly disorder. Is based on careful division, courageous fear, on potential energy, strong weakness, on troop dispositions, the warrior skilled at stirring the enemy provides a visible form, and the enemy is sure to come. He proffers the bait, and the enemy 
is sure to take it. He causes the enemy to make a move and awaits him with full force. The skillful warrior exploits the potential energy. He does not hold his men responsible. He deploys his men to their best, but relies on the potential energy. Relying on the energy, he sends his men into battle like a man rolling logs or boulders. By their nature, on level ground, logs and boulders stay still. On steep ground, they move, square, they halt, round, they roll. Skillfully deployed soldiers are like round boulders, rolling down a mighty mountainside. These are all matters of potential energy. Chapter 6 Weak and Strong Points Master Sun said, First on the battlefield, waits for the fresh enemy. Last on the battlefield, charges into the fray, exhausted. The skillful warrior stirs, and is not stirred. He lures his enemy into coming, or obstructs him from coming. Exhaust a fresh enemy. Starve a well-fed enemy. Unsettle a settled enemy. Appear at the place to which he must hasten. Hasten to the place where he least expects you. March hundreds of miles without tiring, by travelling where no enemy is, be sure of victory by attacking the undefended, be sure of defence by defending the unattacked. The skilful warrior attacks so that the enemy cannot defend, he defends so that the enemy cannot attack. He is a master of his enemy's fate. He advances irresistibly, attacking emptiness. He retreats, eluding pursuit, too swift to be overtaken. If I wish to engage, then the enemy, for all his high ramparts and deep moat, cannot avoid the engagement. I attack that which he is obliged to rescue. If I do not wish to engage, I can hold my ground with nothing more than a line drawn around it. The enemy cannot engage me. In combat, I distract him in a different direction. His form is visible, but I am formless. I am concentrated, he is divided. I am concentrated into one, he is divided into ten. I am ten to his one, many against his few. Attack a few with many, and my opponent will be weak. The place I intend to attack must not be known. If it is unknown, the enemy will have to reinforce many places, the enemy will reinforce many places, but I shall attack few. By reinforcing his vanguard, he weakens his rear. By reinforcing his rear, he weakens his vanguard. By reinforcing his right flank, he weakens his left. By reinforcing his left, he weakens his right. By reinforcing every part, he weakens every part. Weakness stems from preparing against attack. Strength stems from obliging the enemy to prepare against an attack. If we know the place and the day of the battle, then we can engage even after a march of hundreds of miles. But if neither day nor place is known, then left cannot help right. Right cannot help left. Vanguard cannot help rear. Rear cannot help vanguard. It is still worse if the troops are separated by a dozen miles, or even by a mile or two. The enemy may be many, but we can prevent an engagement. Scrutinize him. Know the flaws in his plans. Rouse him. Discover the springs of his actions. Make his form visible. Discover his grounds of death and life. Probe him and know his strengths and weaknesses. The highest skill in forming dispositions is to be without form. Formlessness is proof against the prying of the subtlest spy and the machinations of the wisest brain. Exploit the enemy's dispositions to attain victory. This the common man cannot know. He understands the forms, the dispositions of my victory, but not how I created the forms of victory. Victorious campaigns are unrepeatable. They take form in response to the infinite varieties of circumstances. Military dispositions take form like water. Water shuns the high and hastens to the low. War shuns the strong and attacks the weak. Water shapes its current from the lie of the land. The warrior shapes his victory 
from the dynamic of the enemy. War has no constant dynamic. Water has no constant form. The supreme military skill lies in deriving victory from the changing circumstances of the enemy. Among the five elements, there is no one supremacy. The four seasons have no fixed station. There are long days and short. The moon waxes and wanes. Chapter 7. Maneuvering. Master Sun said, In war, the general receives orders from his sovereign, assembles troops, and forms an army. He makes camp opposite the enemy. The true difficulty begins with the fray itself. The difficulty of the fray lies in making. The crooked straighten in, taking advantage of misfortune. Take a roundabout route and lure the enemy with some gain, set out after him, but arrive before him, this is to master. The crooked and the straight, the fray can bring gain, it can bring danger. Throw your entire force into the fray for some gain, and you may still fail. Abandon camp and enter the fray for some gain, and you may lose your equipment. Order your men to carry their armor and make a forced march day and night. Without halting, march thirty miles at double speed for some gain, and you will lose all your commanders. The most vigorous men will be in the vanguard, the weakest in the rear. One in ten will arrive. March fifteen miles for some gain, and the commander of the vanguard will fall. Only half the men will arrive. March ten miles for some gain, and two in three men will arrive. Without its equipment, an army is lost. Without provisions, an army is lost. Without base stores, an army is lost. Without knowing the plans of the feudal lords, you cannot form alliances. Without knowing the lie of hills and woods, of cliffs and crags, of marshes and fens, you cannot march. Without using local guides, you cannot exploit the lie of the land. War is founded on deception. Movement is determined by advantage. Division and unity are its elements of change. Be rushing as a wind, be stately as a forest, be ravaging as a fire, be still as a mountain, be inscrutable as night, be swift as thunder or lightning, plunder the countryside and divide the spoil, extend territory and distribute the profits. Weigh the situation carefully before making a move. Victory belongs to the man who can master the stratagem of the crooked and the straight. This is the art of the manoeuvring. The military primer says, When ears do not hear, use gongs and drums. When eyes do not see, use banners and flags. Gongs and drums, banners and flags, are the ears and eyes of the army. With the army focused, the brave will not advance alone, nor will the fearful retreat alone. This is the art of managing many. In night fighting, use torches and drums. In daylight, use banners and flags to transform the ears and eyes of the troops. A whole fighting force can be robbed of its spirit. A general can be robbed of his presence of mind. The soldier's spirit is keenest in the morning. By noon, it has dulled. By evening, he has begun to think of home. The skillful warrior avoids the keen spirit, attacks the dull and the homesick. This is mastery of spirit. He confronts chaos with discipline. He treats tumult with calm. This is mastery of mind. He meets distance with closeness. He meets exhaustion with ease. He meets hunger with plenty. This is mastery of strength. He does not intercept well-ordered banners. He does not attack a perfect formation. This is mastery of change. These are axioms of the art of war. Do not advance uphill. Do not oppose an enemy with his back to a hill. Do not pursue an enemy. Fining flight. Do not attack keen troops. Do not swallow a bait. Do not thwart a returning army. Leave a passage for a besieged army. Do not press an enemy at bay. This is the art of war.
Chapter 8 The Variation of Tactics Master Sun said, In war, the general receives orders from his sovereign, then assembles troops and forms an army. On intractable terrain, do not encamp. On crossroad terrain, join forces with allies. On dire terrain, do not linger. On enclosed terrain, make strategic plans. On death terrain, do battle. There are roads not to take. There are armies not to attack. There are towns not to besiege. There are terrains not to contest. There are rulers' orders not to obey. The general who knows the gains of the variations of tactics understands war. The general ignorant of the gains of the variations of tactics may know the lie of the land, but he will never reap the gain of that knowledge. The warrior, ignorant of the art of the variations of tactics, will not get the most from his men. The wise leader, in his deliberations, always blends consideration of gain and harm. By tempering thoughts of gain, he can accomplish his goal. By tempering thoughts of harm, he can extricate himself from calamity. The skillful warrior does not rely on the enemy's not coming, but on his own preparedness. There are five pitfalls for a general. Recklessness, leading to destruction. Cowardice, leading to capture. A hot temper, prone to provocation. A delicacy of honor, tending to shame. A concern for his men, leading to trouble. If an army is defeated and its general slain, it will surely be because of these five perils. They demand the most careful consideration. Chapter 9. The Army on the March Master Sun said, In taking up position and confronting the enemy, cross mountains, stay close to valleys, camp high and face the open, fight downhill, not up. These are positions in mountain warfare. Cross rivers, then keep a distance from them. If the enemy crosses a river towards you, do not confront him in midstream. Let half his troops cross before you strike. If you wish to do battle, do not confront the enemy close to the river. Occupy high ground and face the open. Do not advance against the flow. These are positions in river warfare. Cross salt marshes. Rapidly, never linger. If you must do battle in a salt marsh, keep water plants close by and trees behind you. These are positions in salt marshes. On level ground, occupy easy terrain. Keep high land to the right and rear. Keep death in front and life to the rear. These are positions on level ground. Observation of these four types of positions enabled the Yellow Emperor to defeat the four emperors. If an army's prize is high ground, shun low, they esteem yank, avoid yin. Nurture life and occupy solid ground. Your troops will thrive, victory will be sure. On a mound, hill, bank, or dike, occupy the yang, with high ground to the right and rear. Use the lay of the land to the troops' benefit. When rains upstream have swollen the river, let the water subside before crossing. If you march by a ravine, swamp, reedy marshland, mountain forest, or thick undergrowth, beware, explore them diligently. These are places of ambush. Lairs for spies. When the enemy is close at hand and makes no move, he is counting on a strong position. If he is at a distance and provokes battle, he wants his opponent to advance. If he is on easy ground, he is luring us. If trees move, he is coming. If there are many screens in the grass, he wants to perplex us. Birds rising in flight are a sign of ambush, beasts startled, are a sign of a surprise attack. Dust high and peaking is a sign of chariots approaching. Dust low and spreading is a sign of infantry approaching. Dust in scattered strands is a sign of firewoods being collected. Dust in drifting pockets is a sign of an army encamping. Humble words, coupled with increased preparations, are a sign of impending attack. Strong words, coupled with an aggressive advance, are a sign of impending retreat.
Light chariots emerging first on the flanks are a sign of battle formation. Words of peace, but no treaty, are a sign of a plot. Much running about and soldiers parading are a sign of expectation. Some men advancing and some retreating are a sign of a decoy. Soldiers standing, bent on their spears, indicate great hunger. Bearers of water drinking first indicate great thirst and exhaustion. Birds gather on empty ground. Shouting at night is a sign of fear. Confusion among troops is a sign that the general is not respected. Banners and flags moving are a sign of disorder. If officers are prone to anger, the men become weary. If they feed grain to their horses and meat to their men, if they fail to gang up their pots and do not return to their quarters, then they are at bay. Men whispering together huddled in small groups are a sign of disaffection. Excessive rewards are a sign of desperation. Excessive punishments are a sign of exhaustion. If a general is by turns tyrannical and in terror of his men, it is a sign of supreme incompetence. Envoys with words of conciliation desire cessation. Prolonged fierce confrontation, with neither engagement nor retreat, must be regarded with great vigilance. In war, numbers are not the issue. It is a question of not attacking too aggressively. Concentrate your strength, assess your enemy, and win the confidence of your men. That is enough. Rashly underestimate your enemy, and you will surely be taken captive. Discipline troops before they are loyal, and they will be refractory and hard to put to good use. Let loyal troops go undisciplined, and they will be altogether useless. Command them with civility, rally them with martial discipline, and you will win their confidence. Consistent and effective orders inspire obedience. Inconsistent and ineffective orders provoke disobedience. When orders are consistent and effective, generals and troops enjoy mutual trust. Chapter 10. Terrain. Master Sun said, There are different forms of terrain. Accessible terrain, entangling terrain, deadlock terrain, enclosed terrain, precipitous terrain, and distant terrain. Accessible terrain means that both sides can come and go freely. On accessible terrain, he who occupies high ground and ensures his line of supplies will fight in advantage. Entangling terrain means that advance is possible, but withdrawal is hard. On entangling terrain, if the enemy is unprepared, go out and defeat him. But if he is prepared and our move fails, it will be hard to retreat. The outcome will not be to our advantage. Deadlock terrain means that neither side finds it advantageous to make a move. On deadlock terrain, even if our enemy offers bait, we do not make a move, we lure him out, we retreat. And when half his troops are out, that is our moment to strike. On enclosed terrain, if we occupy it first, we must block it and wait for the enemy. If he occupies it first and blocks it, do not go after him. If he does not block it, then go after him. On precipitous terrain, if we occupy it first, we should hold the high ground and wait for the enemy. If the enemy occupies it first, do not go after him, but entice him out by retreating. On distant terrain, when strengths are matched, it is hard to provoke a battle, and an engagement will not be advantageous. These six constitute the way of terrain. It is the general's duty to study them diligently. In war, the following are not natural calamities, but the fault of the general. Flight, impotence. Decay, collapse, chaos, rout. If relative strengths are matched, but one army faces another ten times its size, the outcome is flight. When troops are strong, but officers are weak, the result is impotence. When officers are strong, but troops are weak, the result is decay. When superior officers are angry and insubordinate and charge into battle out of resentment, before their general can judge the likelihood of victory, then the outcome is collapse. 
when the general is weak and lacking in severity, when his orders are not clear, when neither officers nor men have fixed rules, and when troops are slovenly, the outcome is chaos. When a general misjudges his enemy and sends a lesser force against a larger one, a weaker contingent against a stronger one, when he fails to pick a good vanguard, the outcome is rout. These six constitute the way of defeat. It is the general's duty to study them diligently. The form of the terrain is the soldier's ally, assessment of the enemy and mastery of victory, calculating the difficulty, the danger, and the distance of the terrain. These constitute the way of the superior general. He who knows this and practices it in battle will surely be victorious. He who does not know it and does not practice, it will surely be defeated. If an engagement is sure to bring victory, and yet the ruler forbids it, fight. If an engagement is sure to bring defeat, and yet the ruler orders it, do not fight. He who advances without seeking fame, who retreats without escaping blame, he whose one aim is to protect his people and serve his lord, this man is a jewel of the realm. He regards his troops as his children, and they will go with him into the deepest ravine. He regards them as his loved ones, and they will stand by him unto death. If he is generous, but cannot command, if he is affectionate, but cannot give orders, if he is chaotic and cannot keep order, then his men will be like spoiled children and useless. If we know that our troops are capable of attacking, but fail to see that the enemy is not vulnerable, we have only half of victory. If we know that the enemy is vulnerable, but fail to see that our troops are incapable of attacking, we have only half of victory. If we know that the enemy is vulnerable, and know that our troops are capable of attacking, but fail to see that the terrain is unfit for attack, we still have only half of victory. The wise warrior, when he moves, is never confused, when he acts, is never at a loss. So it is said, Know thy enemy, know thyself, and victory is never in doubt, not in a hundred battles. Know heaven, know earth, and your victory is complete. Chapter 11 The Nine Situations Master Sun said, In war there are nine kinds of ground. Scattering ground, light ground, strategic ground, open ground, crossroad ground, heavy ground, intractable ground, enclosed ground, and death ground. When the feudal lords fight on home territory, that is scattering ground. When an army enters enemy territory, but not deeply, that is light ground. When the ground offers an advantage to either side, that is strategic ground. When each side can come and go freely, that is open ground. When the ground borders three states and the first to take it has mastery of the empire, that is crossroad ground. When an army enters enemy territory deeply and holds several fortified towns in its rear, that is heavy ground. When an army travels through mountains and forests, cliffs and crags, marshes and fens, hard roads, these are intractable ground. Ground reached through Naro Gorgas, retreated from by twisting paths, where a smaller force of theirs can strike our larger one, that is enclosed ground. The ground where mere survival requires a desperate struggle, where without a desperate struggle we perish, that is death ground. On scattering ground, do not fight. On light ground, do not halt. On strategic ground, do not attack. On open ground, do not block. On crossroad ground, form alliances. On heavy ground, plunder. On intractable ground, keep marching. On enclosed ground, devise stratagems. On death ground, fight. The skillful warrior of old could prevent the enemy's vanguard from linking with his rear, large and small divisions from working together, crack troops from helping poor troops, and officers and men from supporting one another. The enemy, once separated, could not reassemble. Once united, could not act in concert. When there was some gain to be had, he made a move. When there was none, he halted. 
to the question, how should we confront numerous and well-arrayed, poised to attack? My reply is, seize something he cherishes, and he will do your will. Speed is the essence of war. Exploit the enemy's unpreparedness. Attack him unawares. Take an unexpected route. The way of invasion is this. Deep penetration brings cohesion. Your enemy will not prevail. Plunder fertile country to nourish your men. Cherish your troops. Do not wear them out. Nurture your energy. Concentrate it. Move your men about. Devise stratagems that cannot be fathomed. Throw your men where there is no escape, and they will die rather than flee. Men who have faced death can achieve anything. They will give their last drop of strength, officers and men alike. Troops in desperate straits know no fear. Where there is no escape, they stand firm. When they have entered deep, they persist. When they see no hope, they fight. They are alert without needing discipline. They act without needing instructions. They are devoted without needing a compact. They are loyal without needing orders. Forbid the consulting of omens, cast out doubts, and they will go on to death. Our men have no excess of worldly goods, and yet they do not disdain wealth. They do not expect to live long, and yet they do not disdain long life. On the day they are ordered into battle, they sit up and weep, wetting their clothes with their tears. They lie down and weep, wetting their cheeks, but throw them where there is no escape, and they will fight with the courage of heroes. The skillful warrior deploys his troops like the snake found on Mount Heng. Strike its head, and the tail lashes back. Strike its tail, and the head fights back. Strike its belly, and both head and tail will attack you. To the question, can an army be like a snake? I reply, yes, it can. Take the men of Wu and the men of Yue. They are enemies, but if they cross a river in the same boat and encounter a wind, they will help each other, like right hand and left. It is not enough to tether horses and bury chariot wheels. There must be a single courage throughout. This is the way to manage an army. Strong and weak, both can serve, thanks to the principle of ground. The skillful warrior directs his army as if it were a single man. He leaves it no choice but to obey. It is the business of the general to be still and inscrutable, to be upright and impartial. He must be able to keep his troops in ignorance, to deceive their eyes and their ears. He changes his ways and alters his plans, to keep the enemy in ignorance. He shifts camp and takes roundabout routes to keep the enemy in the dark. He leads his men into battle like a man climbing a height and kicking away the ladder. He leads them deep into the territory of the feudal lords and releases the trigger. He burns his boats, he breaks his pots, he is like a shepherd driving his sheep this way and that, no one knows where he is going. He assembles his troops and throws them into danger. This is the business of the commander. These things must be studied. The variations of the nine kinds of ground, the advantages of flexible maneuver, the principles of human nature. The way of invasion is this. Deep penetration brings cohesion. Shallow penetration brings scattering. When you leave your territory and lead your men across the border, you enter dire terrain. When there are lines of communication on all four sides, you are on crossroad terrain. When you penetrate deeply, you are on heavy terrain. When you penetrate superficially, you are on light terrain. When there are strongholds to your rear and narrow passes in front, you are on enclosed terrain. When there is no way out, you are on death terrain. On scattering ground, we unite the will of our men. On light ground, we keep them connected. On strategic ground, we bring up our rear. On open ground, we see to our defences. On crossroad ground, we strengthen our alliances. On heavy ground, we ensure the continuity of supplies. On intractable ground, we keep on the move. 
On enclosed ground, we block the passes. On death ground, we demonstrate the desperateness of the situation. It is in the soldier's nature that when surrounded, he resists. When all seems lost, he struggles on. When in danger, he obeys orders. Without knowing the plans of the feudal lords, you cannot form alliances. Without knowing the lay of the land, you cannot march. Without using local guides, you cannot exploit the lay of the land. Ignorance of any one of these points is not characteristic of the army of a great king. When the army of a great king attacks a powerful state, he does not allow the enemy to concentrate his forces. He overawes the enemy and undermines his alliances. He does not strive to ally himself with all the other states. He does not foster their power. He pursues his secret designs, overawing his enemies. Thus he can capture the enemy's cities and destroy the enemy's state. Distribute rewards without undue respect for rules, publish orders without undue regard for precedent, and deal with a whole army as if it were a single man. Apply them to their task without words of explanation, confront them with the advantage, but do not explain the danger. Throw them into perilous ground, and they will survive. Plunge them into death ground, and they will live. When a force has fallen into danger, it can snatch victory from defeat. Success in war lies in scrutinizing enemy intentions and going with them. Focus on the enemy, and from hundreds of miles, you can kill their general. This is success through cunning. On the day you decide to attack, close the passes, destroy the tallies, break off intercourse with envoys, be firm in the temple council for the execution of your plans. If the enemy opens a door, rush in, seize what he holds dear, and secretly contrive an encounter. Discard rules, follow the enemy, to fight the decisive battle. At first, be like a maiden. When the enemy opens the door, be swift as a hare. Your enemy will not withstand you. Chapter 12 the attack by fire. Master Sun said, There are five ways to attack by fire. The first is to burn men. The second is to burn supplies. The third is to burn equipment. The fourth is to burn warehouses. The fifth is to burn lines of communication. Attack by fire requires means. The material must be ready. There is a season for making a fire. There are days for lighting a flame. The proper season is when the weather is hot and dry. When attacking with fire, adapt to these five changes of fire. If a fire breaks out within the enemy camp, respond at once from without. If a fire breaks out but the enemy remains calm, wait, do not attack. Let the fire reach its height and follow up if at all possible. If not, wait. If a fire attack is possible from without, do not wait for the fire to be started within. Light when the time is right. When starting a fire, be upwind. Never attack from downwind. A wind that rises during the day lasts long. A night wind soon fails. In war, know these five changes of fire and be vigilant. Fire assists an attack mightily. Water assists an attack powerfully. Water can isolate, but it cannot take away. To win a victory, to complete an objective, but not to follow through, is a disastrous waste. Hence the saying, the enlightened ruler considers deeply, the effective general follows through. Never move except for gain, never deploy except for victory, never fight except in a crisis. A ruler must never mobilize his men out of anger. A general must never engage battle out of spite. Move if there is gain. Halt if there is no gain. Anger can turn to pleasure. Spite can turn to joy. But a nation destroyed cannot be put back together again. A dead man cannot be brought back to life. So the enlightened ruler is prudent. The effective general is cautious. This is the way to keep a nation at peace and an army intact. Chapter 13 
The Use of Spies Master Sun said, raising an army of a hundred thousand men and marching them three hundred miles drains the pockets of the common people and the public treasury to the daily sum of a thousand tales of silver. It causes commotion at home and abroad and sets countless men tramping the highways exhausted. It keeps seven hundred thousand families from their work. Two armies may confront each other for several years, for a single decisive battle. It is callous to begrudge the expense of a hundred tales of silver for knowledge of the enemy's situation. Such a miser is no commander of men, no support to his lord, no master of victory. Prior information enables wise rulers and worthy generals to move and conquer, bringing them success beyond that of the multitude. This information cannot be obtained from spirits. It cannot be deduced by analogy. It cannot be calculated by measurement. It can be obtained only from men, from those who know the enemy's dispositions. There are five sorts of spies, local, internal, double, dead, and live. When these five sorts of espionage are in operation, no one knows the way of it. It is called the mysterious scheme, the Lord's treasure. Local spies come from among our enemy's fellow countrymen. Internal spies from among our enemy's officials. Double spies from among our enemy's spies. Dead spies are those for whom we deliberately create false information. They then pass it on to the enemy. Live spies are those who return with information. In the whole army, none should be closer to the commander than his spies, none more highly rewarded, none more confidentially treated. Without wisdom, it is impossible to employ spies. Without humanity and justice, it is impossible to employ spies. Without subtlety and ingenuity, it is impossible to ascertain the truth of their reports. Spies have innumerable uses. If confidential information is prematurely divulged, both the spy and recipient must be put to death. In striking an army, attacking a city, or killing an individual, it is necessary to know beforehand the names of the general and his attendants, his aides, his doorkeepers, and his bodyguards. Our spies must be instructed to discover all of these in detail. Enemy spies, come to spy on us, must be sought out, bribed, won over, well accommodated. Then they can be employed as double agents. From the double agent, we discover local and internal spies. The double agent teaches us how best to convey misinformation to the enemy. We know how and when to use live spies from the double agent. The ruler must know all five of these sorts of spies. This knowledge must come from the double agent. So the double agent must be treated generously. Only the enlightened ruler, the worthy general, can use the highest intelligence for spying, achieving great success. These thirteen chapters are the whole representation of the art of war, so said Master Sun.